I get to work at the confluence of environment, climate, human rights, and public health. It's a luxury. I work for, for a philanthropy, the New World Foundation. I work with organizations all across the country at the grassroots level that feel the direct impact of climate. Whether it's groups in Pennsylvania or Florida, local communities that are trying to stop fracking going on in their backyards, or whether it's community organizations in Arizona or Colorado that are trying to make sure that people can actually vote. In all of this work, among the many things I consider myself, is a very proud environmentalist. I'm not just an environmentalist, but I'm a proud environmentalist. But let me tell you something. There was a time in my life when I hated environmentalists. I did not like environmentalists. About 30 years ago, a number of us on our college campus up in Hanover, New Hampshire, were trying to get Dartmouth College to divest its money from investing in South Africa. It was one of the early divestment movements in this country. I happened to be on the tail end of about 20 years of students who were trying to get this done. We occupied the building. We occupied the main administration building. We took it over. We demanded that we will not leave until we have a face-to-face -face meeting with the Board of Trustees the next day. After a series of negotiations, and it was guaranteed that at next morning, at six in the morning, we would all meet with the Board of Trustees at a meeting facilitated by us, we ended up leaving the building. Two days later, the President made an announcement that at the end of that calendar year, Dartmouth would divest its money from South Africa. How did we do that? We built an incredible coalition of people. We had the International Students Association, we had the African American Society, Native Americans at Dartmouth, the Women's Issues League, the Gay and Lesbian Organization, and as we were putting this coalition together, someone said, well, what about the environmentalists? I, one of many, said, absolutely not. We do not want the environmentalists part of this coalition. Why was that? Well, I grew up in South Africa, under apartheid South Africa. And my vision, and what I thought environmentalists were, were people who only cared about the environment and didn't care about people. I grew up thinking that an environmentalist was someone who cared more about animals than they did about people more about the fauna and flora than the people. And so I grew up with almost a disdain for environmentalists and argued that out of everyone on campus, the environmentalists wanted to be part of this coalition, that they are not part of this coalition. And in fact, they were not part of the coalition. So fast forward a little bit, and about a few months goes by, and I'm walking down Hanover, New Hampshire with one of my mentors, Dean Jim Breeden. And we're talking about lots of things, and Dean Breeden at the time was on the board of the New World Foundation, and he said, have you heard about environmental racism? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he said, why don't you come by the office tomorrow? I have some materials for you. So I go to his office the next day, hands me a packet of information, and he says, go home and read this. Go home and read it. It's about environmental racism in the US, the beginning of the environmental justice movement, and my mind is blown apart. People in the US were talking about what was going on in their backyards, where toxic dump sites were being cited, where incinerators were being cited. And it's the first time in my life I was reading about the environment through the eyes of human beings. And it changed my perspective. And I got very excited and I said, what is this? I want to learn more about the environmental justice movement. So he connected me with the New World Foundation and an organization in Boston. And after graduating, I had an internship here. 
and I started learning and I had to relearn what it meant for environmental justice in South Africa. So I went to South Africa and I looked at the impact of apartheid on the environment. Apartheid systematically put 87% of the people on 13% of the land. Just think about that for a second. That's 87% of the people on 13% of the land. So people's impact on the environment also had an impact on them, and this vicious cycle started going through. So I had to go back to South Africa and think, wow, what does this mean to be an environmentalist in South Africa? So I started an organization that the New World Foundation funded to connect the environmental justice movement in the US with the environmental justice movement in South Africa. I got a chance to visit West Dallas, Texas, Richmond, California, Cancer Rally between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, where this massive petrochemical complexes are, and see firsthand what industrialization has done to people, people's lives, and their basic human rights. And so it meant for me that I got really involved in making these connections. And a couple of years later, the New World Foundation came and asked me whether I would come and work for them and be their program officer for environmental justice. So I agreed. And this opened up the world and opened up this country in where I got to visit and who I got to be with and who I got to talk to and have direct exposure to some of the most cutting edge civil rights and environmental movements in this country. As we were doing more and more environmental work, we started realizing that the whole, we needed to be involved in the climate space. What does it mean to work in climate? And everyone was talking about 360 parts per million and atmospheric gas and holes in the ozone. I'd gone and got my masters in this stuff and you were losing me. And I wanted to find a way that we got involved in the climate space in a way that directly impacts people. One way we did that, we went to the Appalachian Mountains. Beautiful mountains. I don't know how much of you, how much of the Appalachian Mountains you know. It's a biological hotspot. It's the most diverse hardwood forests in the world. The most diverse hardwood forests in the world. Absolutely gorgeous. They're incredible. And yet, what are we doing to them? We're blowing them apart. We're blowing mountains apart to get to coal. We're literally bombarding the tops of mountains to get to coal. It's called mountaintop removal coal mining, to remove mountains to get to the coal. They're in such a rush to get to the coal that even the trees that get cut down are not harvested. They're burnt on sight. So I've, I've had the chance to go to West Virginia, Kentucky, work with great organizations like the Ohio Environmental Coalition, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, go up on Cessna Plains and look at this incredible moonscape to get a sense of the scale of what we are doing to these mountains. You only get when you actually get up on a Cessna plain. And when you come down, you have two reactions. There's only two reactions you have. One is, you're either going to laugh hysterically or you're going to cry like a baby. Because when you go up there, you realize what humans are actually doing to the planet. To some extent, I can understand that. But the question that left me was, how is it that we as humans allow other humans to actually do this? And that was a question that perplexed me and really got me thinking, how is it that we're actually allowing this to happen? And so it forced me to really connect with nature. It forced me to connect with what is really out there. And so I had to go back and I had to reclaim some of nature that was out there that I was never exposed to. I went back to South Africa. I learned to become a game guide. I learned how to do tracking. I connected with nature and the South African wildlife in a way I was never taught to do. 
And in nature, I found that my connection here was something incredibly critical. It fed my soul in a new way. It made me think about how we treat the environment and how we treat each other as people are interconnected. That unless we actually have an appreciation for nature and the environment, we're not going to appreciate each other as humans. So how do we do that? How do we get to understand and appreciate each other through nature and nature through each other? And so for me, there were three compelling pieces when I'm in the wilderness that I continuously think about. But before I do that and answer that, I want to remind you of that conversation I had with Dean Breeden. Because on that street that day, he opened my eyes and my world to something I never ever knew about. But all I had to do was look, and it was there. So it makes me go back to, okay, why do we actually do this? And I think there are three things here that we should be aware of. The first for me is how we treat each other as human beings. I think we need to go back and figure out how we interact with each other, how we treat each other as humans. In this crazy society that we live in, I think we've forgotten how to be humans with each other. So we need to reevaluate our relationship with each other. We need to treat each other with compassion, with sympathy, with empathy. And I think we've forgotten some of that. The second thing is we've forgotten our connection to nature. We, if we want to actually save the world, we have to go out there and experience the world. If we don't understand what sustains us, how are we going to save it? All we have to do is go out there and look. And finally, finally, what I think is extremely important is that if we want to save our planet and if we want to save what's left of this planet, and what we're doing to the climate. We not only have to get involved in the climate movement and in the work that climate activists are doing, we have to connect that work to all other movement work that's actually going on. Because you cannot isolate the climate work from everything else that's out there. You cannot think about climate and not think about how climate refugees and immigrants are being treated. You cannot think about climate and not think about economic disparities in this world, in this country. You cannot think about how we treat each other, how we treat our economies, how we treat politics, and how we treat the climate. These things are inextricably linked. And we have to see that. And unless we see that, I think we're doomed. Now, I know it's daunting to think about all of this. It's very daunting to say, I can't make all of these connections all the time. But I think we have to keep trying. And we have to do better than what we're currently doing. Because otherwise, we're going to continue to operate in isolation. And we're going to continue to operate in vacuums. And I know it's daunting. And so I want to, let, I want to end with telling you that while it's daunting, the famous Nelson Mandela said, it's all impossible until you do it. So together, let's go do it.